So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando Resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 U.S. and D.C. 18 plus enter by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited. Welcome to mini episode 136 of Real Life Ghost Stories and I have five spooky stories for you today and the last story comes from July the 27th 2021 and story number one comes from Bianca. A few years ago I was living in this really old house that used to be a school. It had two bedrooms and one bathroom. Since I was a kid I would usually sleep with my parents and one night there was this figure moving around my house. I was really freaked out and tried telling my parents, but I couldn't even move like I was frozen. Eventually, I just fell asleep. But later on, for a whole year, I would have bad dreams, wake up dizzy and see hallucinations. Then it stopped once I finally moved until the first night when I slept in another house that was actually built in the 70s. A two-story home with a basement. Once I fell asleep, I woke up at 2am. Something was very heavy around me. I saw a glowing light in the basement. And now you got me messed up if you think that I'm going to go down there. So I ran up the stairs to my parents and siblings and told them to wake up. My parents checked the basement and all they said was to get into the car. The whole car ride was silent to the hotel. We never went back to that house. Keep in mind that when we went into the house before my parents bought it, Everything was clean, especially the basement. Five years after this incident, my parents told me there were drawings on the wall and some sort of ritual on the floor. All of my dreams and the weirdness stopped after moving one more time. And now everything is peaceful and hopefully it stays that way. When sleep paralysis reoccurs over and over again in a particular house, I wonder if you like went back to that house now and, and say there was some sort of like scientific research done in the house or scientific investigation done in the house I wonder would they find that there was like something that was given off infrasound in the house sorry to be a total will on it and bring up infrasound but I just wonder because you know so many people experience sleep paralysis primarily in one particular household and then it stops when they move out of that household and their circumstances might not have changed like their family dynamic might not have changed or you know they might not have like changed schools or you know kind of personal things that might impact sleep paralysis haven't changed it's the actual building that you're living in so i wonder if it's an infrasound thing i'm just idly musing about that the reality is that we need to know what your parents saw in that basement that made them pack up and leave in the middle of the night take their children and leave and go to a hotel in the middle of the night like what was it I know that years later they said there were drones on the walls and some sort of ritualistic thing on the floor. Like, did somebody break in? Was there somebody in the room? Was the basement glowing because there was candles lit? Or someone had broken in, turned on the light and was conducting some sort of ritual? I I need to know. Like, I need to know the answers to this. And story number two comes from Linda. I was listening to several of your episodes all day. I was distracted by my thoughts of an OBE that I had many years ago and noodling around with the question of does it fit your show? There is no death, no ghosts, nothing like that. When my attention was snapped back to full on nothing is going on but what was being said in my headphones. You were doing an entire episode on OBEs. My experience is not like the others that you featured. There was no bodily harm, no experiences of heaven or hell or past deeds. My experience was in a room full of people, laughing and eating, because we're Italian, and everyone was around a dining room table. I was in middle school. Somehow a small party had emerged at our house. This was not unusual. Mom was the type that people were drawn to her. 
She had a way of making people feel welcome and loved. She was not a great cook, but she knew how to throw together a party spread in minutes. As this party emerged, I was the only one of my three siblings who hung around. All eight chairs around the dining table were taken, so I pulled a bar stool up next to my dad and so was slightly above everyone. I've always been a watcher. I constantly watched people very closely, trying to understand them and figure them out. As I was watching my family laughing, talking and eating, out of nowhere, I just wasn't there anymore. I was at a funeral home, where my family gathered to say goodbye to my grandfather, the first death of any significance in our family. In hindsight, I did not think I was there revisiting his funeral. This was new. As I moved to the casket at the front of the room, I found the very great uncle I had been observing around the dining room table in a casket. I noticed his tie, the flowers that hung around the front of the casket, the suit he was in. I was aware of the entire scene being in a very diffused light, like when photographers make photographs of women less sharp and more dewy-like. Then, as if someone had slapped me awake from sleep, I was back. It was so jarring that I physically rocked on the bar stool, and as there was no back or armrests, I had to grab my father's chair to keep from falling off the stool. I've never been able to express properly how intense the physical and mental experience of coming back was. I've had a couple of experiences that were that intense and I frustratingly do not understand it, but it is brutal and confusing. I was a child who was always confused about people, including myself. I spoke little and watched and listened to others intently. Now I was so utterly confused about myself, my head was spinning. After everyone had left, I took a moment alone with my mother to ask if my uncle was ill. She said he wasn't, not that she knew of, and asked why I was asking. I truly hesitated to tell her. My mother was amazing with other people, not with me or my siblings. I knew she could be untrustworthy with everything, but especially with potentially juicy gossip material. As wonderful as my mother was with other people... She would use privileged information about us to put herself as the centre of attention. But I had no one else to talk to that night. I very quickly reasoned that I could tell one of my cousins or my grandmother, whom I usually looked to for comfort and advice. But I felt like I needed help processing what had happened, or I would never rest. So I told her what I had experienced. It was her turn to be speechless. I prefaced my telling her my story by having her very seriously swear not to speak a word of it to anyone. I went to bed directly after telling her. I closed my eyes tight and prayed with all my heart and soul that I would never experience anything like it again, an action I now regret, and have, as yet, not been able to pray, plead or meditate it back. Less than a year later, my mother picked me up from the gym and very seriously said she had something to tell me. My great uncle had liver cancer. It was very advanced and it was terminal. All of the family were going over to their house to comfort my aunt and my cousins. My mother kept my secret the entire time. The evening of my uncle's rosary, I heard my mother on the phone asking someone what they were burying my uncle in. She asked if it would be a suit or his usual casual attire. And then she asked what his tie looked like. She prefaced this with a response to the person on the phone that she would explain why she was asking these questions later. As we were all leaving the house, my mother gently pulled me back when everyone else had exited. She said she wanted me to be prepared. Everything I had told her was exactly what we were about to see. That moment was by far the most tenderly motherly experience I had ever had with my mother. Sadly, it would be cancelled out at the wake as my inebriated cousin loudly asked who it was that knew about this before the rest of us. Cousins that knew it was to be kept a secret tried to shush him and push him back into his chair, but I'd come in from the patio just in time to hear this and see the look on my mother's face. I left the house. When the final funeral services ended at the cemetery, all twelve of us cousins were hanging out together while the adults mingled and slowly got into cars to reassemble at my aunt's house. As we walked by my uncle's casket, 
I reached out and ran my fingers along the end as I passed. I was immediately and completely overcome with sorrow and bitter overwhelming anger. So much that it physically hurt and I involuntarily burst out into tears and emoted a wail that I could not believe came from me. Because it didn't come from me really. It was my uncle. My fingers slipped off the end of the casket and it was as if it had never happened. As usual, the cousins in my age group were hanging out together on a backyard swing when one of them asked who it was that made that awful sound after the funeral. His sister hit his knee and I had nowhere to escape to. I would never be comfortable with my cousins again. It was as if an asterisk had been put next to my name. Middle school was so difficult and this had made it so much worse. I have no memory of this, but an older cousin mentioned much later how dumbstruck everyone was after the services concluded. There was terrible weather all week. It rained profusely all morning. Then, as the older family members left the final service, the skies cleared and sunshine poured through as though it was a cloudless summer day. Only a few people remember hearing me cry out just before the clouds broke. Even cousins walking right behind me heard nothing. We are all baptised, educated and confirmed Catholics, though few of us practice any more. We are not supposed to believe in any supernatural being other than God and his angels, but our family members have had too many unexplained occurrences between us to not believe. Even that one cousin accepted there is more out there than God, and he was a Monsignor. He loved hearing of our experiences and wished he could have just one of his own. I've had some very featherweight experiences since, but none as intense. I do believe that being a pubescent girl contributed to the experience being so physically expressive and jarring. Directly after my husband and I were married, we went on a three-day honeymoon dash from California to North Carolina for my husband to report to a new marine duty station. We made one stop at the Grand Canyon, in order to take pictures of our kitty, Lefty, sitting on the rim of the canyon. He was a real travelling jack, for those who are familiar with Stephen King. Against my protest, we took a townhouse to live in that was haunted. Lesson learned, but that's a story for another time. Two years later, we were viewing what we thought was our dream home. We went into the backyard. I looked back at the house, and there was the image of a woman. It was angel-like and the most beautiful thing I have ever seen suspended above the house. I then knew the whole story. I told my husband that a woman had died here and was not going to be leaving. I told him the elderly woman had died in the detached double garage, which had been converted into a studio apartment type space and she would haunt us as long as we lived there. He always wants me to be wrong, but sorry babe. Shortly thereafter we were looking through a window into this space, because the real estate lock on the door which held the key would not open. I commented that it looked like a great space for a guest room or an office. The real estate agent agreed and explained that the garage had been converted in order for the owner's elderly aunt to move in but still have her own space. The last thing she said was that the aunt had died a few months before and the owners themselves elderly now could no longer take care of the property so they put the house on the market. She put her hand to her lips and apologised that she should not have given us so much personal information about the property. We left and found a different dream house in the same neighbourhood, which I told my husband was sad and empty and really needed someone to move in and love it, so we had to buy it immediately. We've been here 30 years, and although we have purchased and are moving into a new home out of state when my husband retires next year, this house will remain ours, as a rental until our boys decide to sell it. It means that much to us. We could sell it and pay cash for the new home and have a little left over, but my family is clear that it will remain in our family until I become the ghost haunting this little cottage. I promise that if either one of the boys decide to live here, I will remain quiet and out of sight whenever they are home. Linda, you are a far greater person than I, because if that was me and I was leaving a house to my children, I would be like... If you move into this house, I'm going to haunt the shit out of you. I'm going to haunt you until the day you die. And would I feel any shame about it? Absolutely not. No way. 
That out of body experience sounds intense because it didn't happen in a dream state. It didn't happen when you were asleep at night time, dozing off, waking up. It happened in the middle of a family get together and you were suddenly transported somewhere else to see the death of your uncle. To be honest, I know that you said that you kind of prayed for it not to happen again and then were kind of a bit annoyed that you'd done that and wished that it could happen again. I don't know if I'd like it. And rather than an out-of-body experience, it sounds like you had some sort of psychic event. And I completely understood the need to speak to somebody and try and process what had just happened to you almost immediately because there's no way I'd be sleeping again if that happened to me and I didn't speak to anybody about it. No way. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. One woman. (laughs) I mean, what could possibly go wrong? And her quest to find America's number one meal kit. You just don't get it, do you? With the cost of groceries going up and up, now is the perfect time to get started with HelloFresh. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and it's 25% less expensive than takeout. And defeating an enemy that makes her face who she really is. We're not so different, you and I. And you just need to embrace it. HelloFresh knows you're busy. That's why they take care of the meal planning and the prepping. Freeing up extra time in your schedule. With pre-proportioned ingredients, foolproof recipes and convenient doorstep delivery. HelloFresh makes it easy to get dinner on the table. <laughs> okay, I know, I know this is a movie trailer, but like, why, why would that be a part of your evil monologue? It doesn't just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Hi, that's me. I bet you're wondering how I got here. Well, here's the thing: I've been using HelloFresh for ages and wanted to make the ads worthwhile, you know. But yeah, this is my personal endorsement. It's pretty good. I've been using it for 89 boxes. That's a pretty long time. So, uh, yep. Coming soon to a doorstep near you. Uh, guys, I think you need to come and look at this. It says go to HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStory60 and use code RealLifeGhostStory60 for 60% off plus free shipping. What was that? HelloFresh.com forward slash real life ghost story 60 and use code real life ghost story 60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Today's episode is sponsored by hers. This time of year, all of the emphasis is always on organizing your space, it's always on wellness, it's on spring cleaning, it's on fresh starts. But actually, the most important way to take care of yourself is is to take care of your mental health and you can do so at forhers.com. At forhers.com, you can get access to real medical providers who can prescribe trusted anxiety and depression medication if it is right for you. The process is 100% online, including unlimited check-ins, provider messaging and support along the way. Plus, to make things even simpler, you can get your first month of treatment for just $25 if prescribed. To get started, go to forhers.com slash spring. That's forhers.com slash spring. And I know for some people that getting access to proper mental health care can be a serious source of stress in and of itself. It also can be really difficult to talk to healthcare providers face to face about things like your sexual health, about things like hair loss and about things like your mental health. That is why hers makes it simple. Get started today at forhers.com slash spring. That's forhers, F-O-R-H-E-R-S dot com slash S-P-R-I-N-G. The offer is only available if prescribed. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. The subscription is required. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. 
No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 US and DC 18 plus entered by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited. And story number three comes from PK. I live in Pune in India. I've experienced many things up to now, but this one has scarred me. My brother has a four bedroom duplex apartment in Pune. It's away from the main city and is in kind of a remote area. This is a vacation place for us and we often come here to enjoy parties together. I decided to live here in 2020 due to the lockdown. The apartment has two bedrooms on level one and there are two more bedrooms on level two with a beautiful balcony. I stayed in one of the bedrooms below. One night I experienced some weird noises in one of the bedrooms just above mine and suddenly everything seemed cold. I was scared. I didn't understand what was happening and again the noises from the bedroom above became louder. I thought maybe it could be nothing and I tried to distract myself. But now I started hearing someone sobbing. The noises were like someone throwing the frames around or moving furniture. I ignored all of that and started playing a series on my laptop with loud volume. The next morning I went upstairs and everything was normal, everything was in its place. I thought it might have been my imagination because of the noises that I heard, but again this continued for a week. I stopped sleeping at night and started watching comedy series at night time. I couldn't tell anyone because I thought no one would believe me. Then after a week, I experienced someone running up and down the stairs, moving furniture, and suddenly there were a few knocks on my bedroom door. I heard a woman say, It's too late for me, but you can save yourself. Run! At the same moment, my pet fish jumped out of its tank and died. I ran out of the apartment and stayed all night in the garden. I went back up in the morning to grab my things and leave the place. I entered the apartment and saw everything in its place apart from my pet fish. I couldn't find him. And the last time I saw him, he was on my bedroom floor. Till this day, no one in my family believes me and I do not go to that apartment. I have to say, I totally understand the running outside the door and spending the night in the garden. I would do the exact same thing. I often think about that in horror movies. You know, when people are in horror movies and they run away and they're in a house and they, they, you know, they're running from something and they hide inside. Just run outside. That's what I would do. Just run straight outside. I would feel so much safer outside than inside. For sure. So I totally understand running outside and spending all night in the garden. What happened in that apartment that you were hearing those noises like a lady crying, somebody running up the stairs, knocking on your door saying there's still time for you to get out? That is so super scary. But let me tell you, the comic timing of that fish jumping out of the bowl at that exact time is everything for me. And it would probably really dispel the tension. I think I would feel like, wow, in all of these spooky goings on, this phantom woman running around the house, this is the moment you pick the to dramatically die. I am not remotely trying to trivialise what happened whatsoever. Pets dying is always horrible, regardless of what the pet is and regardless of the circumstances. But it would it would definitely make me raise an eyebrow in the context, for sure. And story number four comes from Tom. About 29 years ago, I went to visit my sister, who was living in a house near the intersection of Elm Street and Cornwallis Avenue in Greensboro, North Carolina. She was renting this house with her husband and three kids. She was very excited about moving and was wanting the family to see it. When I arrived at the house, my wife was at my side. I looked up and into a window on the second floor, which I later found out was my sister's bedroom, and saw a lady with a blue-tinged aura around her. I could easily see that the blouse she was wearing was not from this time period. I knew quickly that this was a spirit, but only mentioned it to my wife. I continued to visit my sister's home and scope it out for any thoughts, feelings I could pick up on, but kept my mouth shut to my sister and her family. My family knew that I saw spirits. I've been seeing things since I was around four years old, but they basically told me to keep my thoughts to myself since it was kind of scary and it was probably past family members checking in on us. It was never family. I did tell my mother, and I should not have, as mothers don't always keep secrets, especially when family members get pissed. On the day of my son's baptism, we had a gathering of family and friends at my home. 
My mother arrived early and pulled me aside to tell me about my sister and her anger. I found out that my sister and some of her kids moved into my parents' house due to some serious spooky events that were occurring. When I finally met with my sister, she was a bit upset that I never told her about the ghost. I actually told her that I had sensed there were two ghosts, one upstairs, I felt it was a woman who was waiting for someone, and a ghost in the basement, something dark and looming. This did not help matters. Over the course of her time there, her family was hearing footsteps coming up and down the stairs and heard furniture being moved around. Her two youngest children were scared of what was happening in their home. My sister's husband was not much of a believer until one eventful night when they were lying in bed and the door to their bedroom opened up fully and then closed on its own. Not only did my sister live in the home, but she also had her office in the same house. Near the end of her time there, she called me over to the house and asked me to come over. Again, they did not want me talking much about the ghosts as it scared them, but they were past that point. When I arrived, she said that her and a co-worker were hearing a lot of noises in the house, like tapping at the windows, the sort of sounds that you'd hear during a very windy day. All of a sudden, they heard a crash. When they investigated, they found the basement door open and a pane from the kitchen window door, which was directly opposite to the basement door, was blown outwards, away from the house. The kitchen door was locked, and no one could have gotten into the house without somebody noticing, especially since they had a big dog. I found glass all over the ground outside. A few months later, my sister left the house and told the family they rented the home from that notification that the house was haunted would have been appreciated. The family who owned the home said nothing. First of all, I just want to say, Tom, that well done for respecting people's boundaries. And when your family said, we know that you see some spooky shit, we don't want to see that spooky shit. If spooky shit happens, we're just going to say that it's family members coming back to check in on us. And you respected that and you said, okay, I'm not going to tell you then. And that is the right thing to do. But obviously, it then puts you in in between a rock and a hard place because later they are berating you for not telling them when that is exactly what they asked you to do was not tell them. It sounds like you handled it pretty well though. And sounds like a pretty tough time for your sister and her family. Like it does not sound like they had a good time with footsteps and noises and having to leave and I'd be pretty conflicted too because I'd feel like I want to know what's going on but I'm also frightened to know what's going on because I don't know if I want to hear the answers. That's a pretty tricky situation to be in and it also must be really difficult when you have this supernatural information and people have explicitly said that they don't want to hear it and then you have to go okay I'm just not going to tell you then. It must be really difficult to keep it all inside. And story number five comes from Sarah. In my life, I've had a fair few experiences with the paranormal. Whether I'm sensitive to it or just had bad luck, I don't know. The most intense and long-running encounter occurred in my last house, where I lived with my two very young sons. I lived there for a year until I moved us in with my parents after one particular night that would stay with me forever. I was the first tenant in the house as the landlord had just bought it, and initially nothing happened. But then I started hearing sounds on the stairs after my kids had gone to sleep. It was just shuffling footsteps, and I distinctly remember the sound of the banister rattling as if someone was slowly climbing the stairs. I convinced myself that it was a draft. The house had a small front and back garden, which the previous owners had clearly put some work into, but it had been left to become overgrown and wild. One day, I gardened and tried to tidy it. I pulled out some plants, trimmed the grass and weeded. I hate gardening. As I was working away, I looked up and saw an elderly woman by the window. She was tall and thin, with peppery grey curls and stern features. Before I could even say hi, she was gone, like she just faded into the reflection on the window. I had only just moved in and thought maybe I'd seen a nosy neighbour in the back passage inspecting my gardening. Either way, she didn't look happy. That night, my bedroom lamp swayed and swayed. I watched it swing above me, thinking I was dreaming, but it kept violently swinging until it suddenly stopped as if someone had caught hold of it. Other things happened like this. Not when my children were home, though. I noticed the difference immediately. 
It wasn't that I missed them, but it felt like I was living with someone who outright hated me, but liked them. The only instance involving the kids was once my son had said he loved the colour of a particular flower in the garden. The next morning, I found every bloom from that plant tucked under his pillow. I had remade his bedding at bedtime, and I had sat in the garden painting those flowers that evening because he had asked me to. I can't explain how they got there. Aaron, my son, said, My friend got them for me. From then on, things steadily escalated. I was constantly being woken by banging and tapping on the walls. It always sounded like it was next to me. My bedroom would go intermittently ice cold. I sometimes would feel like someone was shaking me awake. I would wake up with lots of little bruises. My boyfriend was convinced they looked like someone had pinched me. As a clumsy mum of young children, you could explain away minor bruises, but they would wake me up, and it became a part of my daily life. The worst moment for me was one night I came home late from work. My boys were with their dad, and I was desperate to just go upstairs and shower away a really frustrating day of work. My front door opened straight onto my stairs. As I stepped in, I could see a dark figure at the top of my stairs. It was tall and thin, like an opaque but stretched shadow. It was faceless, just black with long arms hanging at its side. I was frozen at the bottom of the stairs, immobilised by sheer terror. I watched it step away from the stairs, walking as if heading to my room before it stepped into the air, vanishing. Then I went to bed. I don't really remember why or deciding to do it, but I calmly walked upstairs and got into bed at 5.40pm. That was the time that I'd parked outside. Then I went to sleep, still wearing my coat, scarf and shoes. I woke up the next day at 1230 That terror filled me again and I ran to the toilet to vomit. My phone was filled with messages from my parents checking in and my ex wondering why I hadn't picked up the boys at 11am. I explained it to my mum and she let me stay over as I was so freaked out. Then within a week I moved back in under the pretext of saving money. I thought it was her way of getting us out of the house. The day I was packing up my things my next door neighbour Anne invited me in so I could pick up a parcel that had been delivered while I was at my parents. While waiting I spotted a picture on the fridge of a few of my neighbours and an old woman with dark grey curls. I immediately recognised her, and I asked who she was. She told me it was May. She had lived in the house since she married at 18 until she died suddenly last year. The garden had been her pride and joy, and she loved children but was never able to have them herself. She referred to herself to Anne's grandchildren as Nanny May. I don't know what was in that house. Just May or something else but there was definitely something or someone who had ill intentions towards me. I never thought my children were unsafe, though. It was opposite to that, and despite my negative experiences, I think May cared for them. I like to think she was warding off whatever didn't like me from going towards the boys. Oh, that is some freaky shit. Like, you physically saw May in the garden, in a way that you thought you should say hello to her. So your brain at the time obviously thought that was a real physical person and then she disappeared. And then those flowers that your little boy said that he loved a particular flower and they all appeared under his pillow. Is it possible that he sleepwalked out and picked all of the flowers and put them under his pillow but then he said my friend got them for me? (gasps) I don't know. What was that thing at the top of the stairs? Because it doesn't sound like the same energy that May had. Do you know what I mean? That sounds pretty intense to see that thing at the top of the stairs and then it sort of steps into thin air. Sounds like a pretty negative experience. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Thank you to Bianca, Linda, Tom, PK and Sarah for sending in your stories. Remember, the last story came from July the 27th, 2021. And if you're wondering... Where are the main episodes? Why are there no main episodes at the moment? It's because I'm taking a little break and they will be back in a couple of weeks time. If you would like to find out anything about Real Life Ghost Stories, you can do so by checking out reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com and on that note, I shall see you next time.
So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando Resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 US and DC. 18 plus entered by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited.